Welcome everyone to our Alumni Spotlight event series where we shine a light on the expertise and fashion and passion rather of Imperial alumni around the world. I'm Nicola Pogson and I'm Director of Alumni Relations and it's a real pleasure to welcome you here today. We have alumni joining us from 26 countries around the world, from all four faculties across the college and from years graduation, uh, graduating years from 1961 to 2020. And talking about our international alumni, I wanted to wish a happy 14 juillet or Bastille Day for our French alumni who may be joining us. Before starting, I just really wanted to thank many members of our community who have been so supportive and engaged over this unprecedented period where we've uh, reached out to our community and asked them for support in talking to prospective students to support our current students and just to engage within the alumni community. We've talked to our group leaders and there's this incredible sesh, uh, pre um, there's an impression of people coming together and that's really heartwarming. So I wanted just to thank you very much for that. I know the situation is very different in different countries around the world, but I hope wherever you are, you're keeping well and you are keeping safe. So we're very delighted to be talking to David Keane here today. David is an Imperial Alumnus MBA 2012, and he's had a varied and very interesting career as in senior marketing positions in major brands, such as um, including Google and Salesforce. David is also a very active and engaged alumnus. He sat on the Business School's Alumni Advisory Board. He's a current member of Imperial Court. He was a judge on our Alumni Awards panel that we had launched last year. And he has also mentored entrepreneurs. So very, very active. And so we were delighted that he agreed to support us and uh, participate in this first Alumni in the Spotlight event. I'll be kicking off with a number of questions, but at any time, please ask your questions in the Q&A function of your toolbar. Uh, you can give the thumbs up if uh, you want to particularly like questions by other alumni. We'll be asking most popular questions in priority, but we hope to get to all your questions within the hour that we have together. This is being recorded, so please don't give away any personal information in your questions that you wouldn't want to share and feel free to include only your first name when you with your questions. So David, a very big welcome to you. We're delighted to have you here to get today and um, I would say let's get started. Can you give us a potted history of your career? Really, really happy to be here, Nicola. Thank you so much. Can you hear me OK? Thumbs up? Yes, good. Um, before I jump into that, I just want to send my best wishes to everybody that's out there from Imperial, or the alumni listening today. It's a really tough time for everybody and I really hope you're holding up well, um, that your family, your friends and yourselves are, are all healthy and well and um, that everything's okay. So potted history, so my, my, my career. Um, I came out of school after my A-levels and actually had a, had a position at that time to come to Imperial to study electronic engineering. And um, Nicola, I'm sorry, sorry to reveal this to you, but I actually rejected Imperial for my bachelor's degree and I actually went to become an apprentice. So a little bit of an unusual path. So I became an apprentice programmer, programming big old IBM mainframes, um, which are now just things that you see in movies, I think. This dates me quite a lot. So I spent many years then working, implementing systems, building computer systems from the ground up, I then subsequently became a trainer, a technology trainer, and started to communicate with people more, teaching them how to design databases, how to implement systems, how to manage projects, how to use advanced and new technologies. And then I was really, really fortunate that I got picked up by Oracle, the big database and applications vendor, to work for them in their UK development hub as a product manager. Whilst as a product manager there, I kind of traveled the world, evangelizing the internet, telling people about you know the amazing things that you could do with it this is the late 90s at this point this is before the dot-com bubble um, and that was an amazing amazing time the final part of my career at oracle which was a fairly large long period of time i moved more from that product and external evangelism world across to actually selling and marketing products so building out Oracle's middleware platform, the Java tools, the, all of the tools and infrastructure that we use today to build out internet products. 
and really worked with our sales teams and our customers on getting them to adopt those things. So my trajectory really was from kind of engineer through to product manager and then through to more business development, sales, marketing. I then got hired by SAP, the big German software company, and went across to join them to head up a marketing function across Europe, Middle East and Africa, where I worked for a number of years just doing pure solution and industry marketing as a leader. And then I was asked to move across and run their competitive intelligence function globally. Um, clearly, my background at Oracle and at SAP allowed me to think in two ways. And one of my themes here is as you develop your careers, thinking about how can you bring something unique to the people um, that you work with and the people who are going to employ you. So at that point in my career, my uniqueness was that I could think in the mindset of an SAP employee and customer, and I could think in the mindset of an Oracle employee and Oracle customer, and I could lead teams in different styles and be very situational. And this was really valuable to them at that time. And that was something that really accelerated my career. I then decided that I was going to finally go to Imperial. So I signed up to do an executive MBA um, and joined Nicola and the whole team there, which is for the wonderful experience of doing an exec MBA. And during that time, I took a role with Salesforce.com as their UK and Ireland CMO. So running a fairly large team, fairly large business, but I was in the UK most of the time. So I could actually, I, I could be here and I could work both on the MBA and work in business. And then when the MBA was done, I was looking for a startup, really looking for a small agile startup, and I kind of joined Google by accident. But interestingly, I joined Google Enterprise, which was a, a small internal startup at the time, which is now Google Cloud, which is a $10 billion business, um, and had a bunch of amazing roles at Google. Again, developing my marketing skills, the skills down the sales funnel, engaging with salespeople. And then finally, last year, I left Google and joined a startup. So joined a small fintech in Liverpool Street and have recently during the pandemic pandemic moved from that fintech to an e-commerce startup and we're working on a relaunch and a rebrand. So I'm not going to reveal names and things there, but we're selling very actively into the e-commerce, the digital e-commerce space and the transition to online that everybody's going through. So in it, it's quite an interesting career starting from an apprentice, going through an engineer, sales, marketing, and then more specialist areas, and then moving up to CMO and that executive leadership piece. Thank you. And I know that one of the questions that people often ask you, uh, they're very attracted by the brand name Google. So let's kind of get that out of the way. Um, Good idea. And any, uh, any particular reasons? I mean, you say you kind of fell, fell into it almost, but uh, why at that stage of your career or perhaps any tips you have for people thinking about joining a brand such as Google? So when you join a brand such as Google, so what's the magic about joining Google? You have to stand out, okay? So they get lots of applications for the roles. And that when they assess candidates, and when I was interviewing and assessing candidates, they assess them on four lenses, four criteria. These four criteria, and I'll go through each one for you, because this is your kind of rubric for getting a job inside of Google. You've got to ace all four of these. This is the marking scheme for getting a job at Google. Don't tell anyone I told you this. Role related knowledge is first. So you have to really be able to do the thing that you're trying to get into. So if you're going in to be a marketing leader or a marketing manager, you really need to be able to do that well. And they'll interview you very, very specifically around your capabilities in the domain where you're landing. So tip number one is land in a job somewhere like Google where you really know what you're doing and you can really ace it as a role in itself. And then you can subsequently move to other jobs later on, but don't try and apply to things that you maybe have three quarters or half of the skills of, because they've got lots of people with the full skill complement. Second piece is leadership. Anyone who gets hired in Google needs to demonstrate leadership regardless of role. Mm -hmm. So you would be managing a virtual team of people across both kind of freelancers, contractors, agencies, people across different functions. So you're managing squads of people to deliver results. 
So you need to be a leader regardless of your role. So you've got to have role related capabilities and be able to roll up your sleeves. You've got to be a leader who can coordinate and inspire followership amongst people. You then need to be able to solve problems. It's called general cognitive ability, GCA inside of Google, and they will ask you problems such as, you know, um, if you were to open a coffee shop in Paris, how would you go about it? And really the, the, the idea there is that you walk through a logical problem solving process for something you've not done before. So you've got to be able to demonstrate you're able to fix things and work things out and plan things you've not done before. And then finally, there's a, a creativity lens, which they call googliness, which is what makes you different? What makes you creative? So can you be both a left brain and a right brain person? Do you have sparkle and glitter? What makes you stand out? If you, That's the marking scheme. So if you can ace all four of those, you've got a really good chance of competing against the other people that are in there and getting down to the final shortlist. Um, but if you can't nail all four of those, if you can't demonstrate great role rate related abilities, you know, for example, if you're going in, into a sales role, you need to already be able to sell unless you're going into kind of a very, a very entry level role. Um, you need to be able to sell and you need to have a good track record of achieving quota. Very, very simple things such as that. So that's the secret sauce, Nicola, for getting a job. Um, if you ever if you ever apply, Nicola, then let me know and I'll, I'll give you some one on one coaching. But um, for everyone else, you've got those four lenses to think about role related knowledge, leadership, problem solving and then creativity and sparkle. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, and when we were pre preparing for this and you've kind of alluded it, to it already, you we talked about the the extra magic um, mm -hmm. you were touching on. Uh, the extra magic that people can bring to their careers and that go beyond qualifications and how important that can be. Yeah. Can you uh, expand on that a little bit now? So my philosophy on hiring and building a team is that you look for diversity in the team around multiple different vectors. So you look for diversity of background, diversity of culture, diversity of thinking. And also you look for people who have different superpowers. Maybe superpowers is a way to think about it, Nicola. So, you know, what's your individual superpower? When I got my very big step up to a, glo a global vice president role at SAP, my superpower was that I could think SAP and I could think Oracle. No one else around me could do that at the time there. You know, people, the people I was working with thought very much in that one mindset and couldn't necessarily jump between two. Each job that you go for, each career step that you take, one of the key things will be figuring out what's your superpower, what's your magic, what can you bring to the table? So if I look now in my career more on the startup side, the superpower that I can bring to a business is the ability to scale. So I've got a lot of experience taking a business that's found product market fit and is working through product channel fit and scaling and going maybe from, you know, multiple millions of revenue to tens or hundreds of millions of revenue and actually putting scalable processes, structures, structures, methods in place and bringing kind of order to some of that startup kind of chaos that goes on in the early part of the life of a business. If I joined a business that was too young, I wouldn't thrive because my superpower wouldn't fit in there. So when each of you are thinking about your career and thinking about what to do next, just try and be really reflective and re try and think carefully about, you know, what would your superpower be in regard to the job that you're going after? Do you have a superpower? If they ask you that question in the interview, what is your superpower? What would you say? How would you describe it? You know, what makes you really, really different? And that's really important for any role that you go for. And anybody I'm hiring, I try to identify what makes them different. Can they do the job? Yes. Now what makes them different and what makes them different to the other team members? That's lovely. Thank you. My light's just gone off. I'm going to wave my arms. <laughs> um, in your TED talk, uh, Failing to Learn, you talk about 
how to fail well and how to exceed, succeed. So can you share with us an example where you did just that? Yeah, I mean, the, maybe to for maybe to kind of go back and just kind of sum up some of the thinking there around failure. There's kind of two routes to success. The first route is you're a natural born genius and you only ever need to do things in one step and you always are you always are correct you always win it always works out now there may be a few people who are very very gifted in the world i'm certainly not one of those but most people 99.9 .9 or maybe 100 percent of people actually have to put the hard work in and have to go through multiple steps to find an answer to the solution that they're looking for. You know, if you go back to, you know, any of the great labs where the great, you know, great inventions have come out of, you know, if you look at Edison or kind of Bell Labs or any of those things, the inventions that come from them generally are many, many different experiments that gather data, that gather experiences, that build capability. And I think one of the tricks to this is how you set your mind to look at failure. So failure is something that is good for you, but it feels really bad when you fail at something. And to make failure feel a little better is about thinking about it in terms of learning. So if you can accept the premise that to get to your goal, you have 10 steps or maybe 100 steps, and each step you have to gather a certain piece of data build certain capabilities and create relationships and you know, intellectual capital, if you like, then if you can kind of almost map the journey from A to Z out across those steps, then you can see each of those steps where you've not hit your goal as being really successful because you've gathered those things that you're looking for. Now, if I look at my career, then my career kind of at the end of being an engineer, for example, I kind of didn't really know what I wanted to do. I'd been an engineer for about 10 years, implemented a lot of software, written a lot of software, and I was looking for something different. I kind of had this itch in me, this kind of like, OK, I know I want to do something different and I don't know what it is. So what I did then was I went out and I started experimenting with things. So I started going out and kind of speaking at events and kind of talking to people about kind of software development, software engineering. And what, one of the things that I found from that was that initially I was really, really nervous and I found it very, very hard to do. But after a while and after taking some training, I started to really enjoy it. And I'm like, OK, I, I found my feet there. I quite like this communication side of myself. And the journey I went through there really was going from being that more kind of project oriented, you know, cut code, test code, deliver code, implement systems to somebody who was more on the training and change management side. And then I moved full scale into the training world and I didn't really have a plan at this point. These were all steps that were coming from learnings. Each of them gave me capability and as a result of them, I then ended up getting hired by Oracle as product manager because they were looking for somebody who was structured, who was thoughtful about technology, who could code and understood technology, who could bridge customers and engineers because customers and engineers, when you mix them together, don't generally go particularly well and they can't fully understand each other. One's talking code, one's talking business. Um, so that product management role really came out of the fact that I identified that I had I was looking for something and I didn't know what I was looking for. So I started experimenting and those experiments led me to that real step change in my career where I moved from end user computing into software vendor computing and building products and selling them. And then it kind of moved on from there. So I think everybody has the opportunity to get out there and think, OK, I don't feel 100 percent happy with the world that I'm in right now or the role that I've got. You don't have to just go vertically up. Many people think, right, my next job, I'm now a marketing manager. My next job is senior marketing manager, then principal marketing manager, then marketing director. 
and senior marketing director and VP and CMO. You don't have to follow a ladder that goes up. And I think the way that I would think about this is to try and ask yourself the question, what kind of career are you looking for and what kind of person are you? And I would categorize this into two basic frameworks. The first framework is an I-shaped career. Now, if you're going to be a brain, a brain surgeon, for example, you know, you go to med school, you then specialize, you then get many years working on the brain, you then start to support other surgeons and you work all the way to being a consultant. It's a linear path. Many finance roles can be similar to that as well. But if you're looking for a role that actually gives you diversity of experience, then that, that to me is what you would call a T-shaped role where, you know, and my career is a very T-shaped career where I was an engineer. Then I worked on communications and training and change management. Then I became a product manager. So you can see I've got kind of parallel roles there and I'm not necessarily moving up in the organization. I'm moving laterally. But then after a while, you get all of these different connections that work together and you become quite unique. And then you can actually use those to start to move up at that point. So, um, yeah, that that that's that's the, the framework that I would encourage people to think about, Nicola. Thank you. And I I hear from that be brave, curious. I hear from that be brave, curious. And also I know that we have uh, quite a few people from our faculty of medicine joining mm. and and I often uh, know that they are looking for different ways of, of moving up in what we might not consider to be a career from if you're in the, the business world, but there's ways of using those skills. Um, and this has obviously been a very challenging period, particularly uh, for people in the medical profession, but for all of us, both on a personal and professional level. And so I wanted to talk from the professional side first, um, from a marketing leadership mm. perspective. Uh, what do you think a brand needs to consider when responding uh, to a situation like this? So a situation like this is a difficult time and really you would start with kind of what you are going to be communicating and then how you are going to communicate that. You start in a situation like this from your values. The values that you've defined as a team, as a brand, as a business, do they still hold true? during the pandemic, during a crisis period such as this. And that's really an initial assessment that you do. If you've thought deeply about your values as a business and your values as a brand and they hold water during a tough time like this, then you can leverage them. You can be authentic. You can be your authentic self. Trying to just leverage the pandemic as a kind of demand generation tactic, for example, is a really, really bad strategy. It's a really bad way to go. Trying to figure out how you help other people, what you can give those other people, what you can contribute and think about putting the customer first and the person that's actually going to be using your service. That's really to me where you where you start in this case. So it's all about what can you champion? Who can you champion? How are you going to help those people? How are you going to think about the service that you bring and the why? to quote Simon Sinek in his very, very famous book, you know, if you start with why you are doing things and your values, then you can't really go too far wrong. If you focus too much on how do we make a fast buck at this point, then that's not going to play particularly well because once that kind of behavior comes out, people see through you and you're seen as not contributing to the world that's out there. So in, in the previous startup I was at, the fintech startup, which I've now moved from, we focused very, very heavily on lobbying, kind of policy work, government policy work, trying to advocate for small business and kind of what small business is needed, um, helping governmental bodies and also trade bodies understand what we were seeing from a demand perspective and a supply perspective, opening up data to those businesses and giving them that kind of backing and being a, being very much a team player in that situation. So as a brand, you need to think about the messaging and the how that you're going to push out there around your core service. You also need to think at this point, do you pivot? Do you do something different? 
is your product still viable at this time? If you find that the product that you've got and the thing that you're working with really doesn't make sense at this time, you need to adjust, you need to change. And, you know, if you think about a basic, you know, acceptance cycle that we all go through when anything dramatic happens, you can very much apply that to kind of a brand narrative and how businesses have responded to COVID-19. You know, the first stage of that, and, and these stages can, can coexist as well. You know, it's about fear and then denial and then depression and then acceptance. So as leaders around a brand in terms of marketing leaders, business leaders, we need to help our teams work very much in that area of acceptance that something has changed, something fundamental has changed, something dramatic has changed. We're not going back to the old world. Anyone who thinks we're going to be back in 2019 in the 2019 world is, is dreaming. It's not going to happen. We need to accept that actually we're in this new new world. We need to map it out. We need to understand our value proposition. Think carefully through the go to market strategies that we've got for that value proposition. Do we have a customer base that we can engage? Do we have a product that will actually allow us to survive as a business? And then what's the bigger ecosystem around that? Either industry bodies, other companies, governmental bodies, who do we engage and how do we leverage to find advantage and to be able to deliver service in that in that new normal that we're going into right now? And I want to also move on to kind of the personal side of things and, mm -hmm. and just before I do that I just want to anybody listening can start uh, putting some questions in the uh, Q&A if you want to ask any particular questions although we got lots for David but uh, if you have any specific ones that'd be great too but from the personal side of yeah. leading and you you have touched on it on, on a, a number of times but uh, in different ways what's your concept of self-leadership um, at a time particularly like this one? So I think at a time like this, there's a whole mental health piece that we need to think about for our teams, for our people and for ourselves. Um, I'm our mental health first aid leader um, in the business and I, I teach mental health first aid as well as part of Mental Health First Aid England. Um, it's about recognising and being self-aware about your own state of mind, how you're responding. We all go through during a difficult time like this, we all go through difficult patches. So we have moments when everything's OK, everything's looking really positive. Everybody has moments where things look bleak, they feel bleak, we feel down. Maybe we're in a little bit of that depression cycle or that fear cycle uh, of, of, of getting to acceptance. And it's about actually helping yourself understand how you're working helping yourself and those around you understand kind of who's okay who's not okay you know anybody can be going through a period of time where they're not okay and they need help it's not a weakness it's not a failing and i think it's down to every one of us to keep, be very empathetic and really try and understand the people around us try and understand their responses to these really difficult times particularly people who've had loved ones friends family members um who've been ill or who've, who've, who've passed away you know those people are going through very terrible times everybody is going through a tough time in terms of worries around kind of financial stability their jobs the fact that they're stuck at home with their kids kind of jumping around the whole time and you know they're trying to work we're all going through a period of strain a period of difficulty so i would start with self-awareness i'd start with kind of trying to recognize personal leadership and self-leadership as a concept. So if you think about the idea of leading other people, then when you're leading other people, it's your job to figuratively stand on the table and see further than them and try and say that's the direction that we're going in. And then make sure everybody gets in that direction and kind of moves there and pick up stragglers and help anyone who's struggling along the way. Self-leadership is about understanding your personal direction, and your personal mission. And if you like standing on that figurative table and saying, OK, that's the direction I'm going in. I know this is the thing that I want to do. 
I'm going to head in that direction and I'm going to take those around me with me, but also I'm going to recognize when I need help. I'm going to recognize when I need to take a break. I'm going to recognize the techniques that allow me to recharge, to inspire myself, to take time away. You know, one of the things that's happening during this pandemic is people have stopped taking vacations because they can't go anywhere. So they think I'm going to save the vacation till later. So therefore, people are working mainly at home five days a week, sometimes more, without any break whatsoever. You know, when did you last have a have a vacation? When did you, even if you take a week off and you're staying at home in your apartment or your house, um, you know, and just doing nothing and just recharging. And if you have taken some vacations, what other things are you doing to recharge? And I'll give you maybe a, a metaphor that's that's useful in this kind of self-awareness of kind of stress levels and anxiety levels that you may be feeling or those around you may be feeling. If you think of the concept of just a bucket, a regular bucket that you might use to kind of clean a floor or something. And the concept here is that each of us has one of these buckets and it's called a stress bucket. So the stress bucket is where all of your stress and anxiety goes. Now, I may have a tiny little stress bucket and Nicola there may have a huge big stress bucket and can tolerate masses of stress. Each of us has a different size bucket, okay? And it's our job to recognize and assess how big that bucket is and to figure out when we need to take stress out of that bucket. So think of it a little bit like water filling up a bucket. If the, if the water overflows, then that's why when we have problems, we have breakdowns, kind of we lose it. If we can think about putting taps in the side of the bucket towards the bottom and figuring out what taps we have that can help us drain all of that stress and anxiety. So for me, I really like running. So if I go out and do a nice long run, that drains a lot of my stress bu bucket. So I've, I've, I've had a tough day, I'm feeling stressed, things aren't going to plan. I go out and have a, a nice long run and it really drains that bucket well. Other people like to read or go for a walk, or cycle or maybe watch some TV. There's a million different things that you can do out there. Meditation is a great way to do it. But recognizing what are the things that allow you to drain that bucket and which things are kind of false drains on that bucket. So, for example, drinking or taking any any kind of substance, whilst it may be relaxing initially, in the longer term will add to your stress bucket. So managing stress, managing anxiety, coming up with metaphors and techniques and approaches to doing that, self leadership around setting your own personal direction so that you can say, right, this is what I'm going to do. My life has not stopped because we've got a pandemic running right now. My life is still here. We're moving forward. I'm going to do the things I wanted to do. I'm going to take my loved ones with me and we're going to get there and we're going to do these things. We might need to change a little. That's fine. But actually recognizing that and being sufficiently self-aware to keep going instead of just stopping is really, really key. So that that's kind of that would be some early thinking on um, that self-leadership, Nicola. Uh, thank you, David. And um, it's true that uh, in terms of holiday, I was meant to be in France today, but uh, I am still going on holiday next month But uh, and, and planning my holidays ahead. It's, it is really important. I, I feel that need and I think everybody should if, if they're able to. Um, I've got kind of two questions because we are getting some questions about how you along that, how do you achieve a healthy work life balance when yeah. trying to climb the career ladder, which you'll touch, you kind of touched on there. So maybe you felt you've said enough, but let me know if there are any other tips. And the other one is um, give it, you have a keen interest in mental health and I wondered where that came from. OK, so maybe the kind of work life balance one is a, is a good start. Um, Being busy, filling your days with activities, sending hundreds of emails does not deliver outcomes. So in terms of maintaining an effective work life balance, the coaching I would give on that would be to think very carefully about the outcomes that you're looking to achieve and alongside those out outcomes, the key results that really kind of build up to them. And 
those outcomes and key results, we call them OKRs, are really the key thing that you would measure yourself on rather than measuring yourself on being busy. And it's very easy to be very busy and it's very hard to say no to people and say, well, actually, that thing isn't going to move the dial. But kind of coming back to personal leadership, if you think about defining your own OKRs for your career, like what are your objectives? What are your outcomes? What are your goals? And there's tons of stuff online. I'm not going to paraphrase all of the kind of work on, on OKRs and different goals, goal setting techniques. But as you start to do that for yourself and to think about what are the things that I want to achieve and how do I get to those things? And what are the it's coming? It's like this experimentation idea, like what are the steps to get from here to the goal that I've set myself? And does that require me just to be really, really busy or does that require me to think very carefully about what are the steps that I take to get there? And maybe go a little bit slower, a little bit more deliberately. Think carefully about the steps. No one ever got any prizes for being busy. People get prizes for actually being decisive and thinking carefully about the direction to take and the steps that you need to take there. So as you build your career, as you build that kind of journey that you're on, doing that goal setting, thinking carefully about it, also thinking carefully about real objectives and key results that you might put in place. So when I talk to people, they often say, well, look, I want to be a CMO before I'm 30. So I say, OK, that's fair enough. Why do you want to be that? Well, I want to be that because I can earn lots of money. OK, so your your real objective here is earn lots of money. No, I also want to have a good title. OK, so you want to earn lots of money and have a good title. Does it have to be in marketing or is it going to be somewhere else? Well, I don't really care where it is. I just I'm really motivated by money right now. So why are you motivated by money? So you can kind of unpick things in that way to understand really what's at the core of the achievement that you want. Is it just money that you're chasing or status or is there something else that you're looking for around achievement or legacy or working with people or living in different places and experiencing different things? You know, is it is it measurable in terms of a number or is it more around experiences? So I'd really encourage people to think very carefully about that direction that you're taking, how you want to build your career. Um, and the other thing that I would say about this is experiment. Going back to that failure thing. So my son Dylan has just finished at Manchester University. Sorry, Nicola, he didn't go to Imperial because he said he wanted to leave London and get away from us. Um, so he just finished biomed in Manchester and He's done his bachelor's degree, got a great result, and now he's going to go off and work for a year before doing his master's. And I was out with him the other night. We just went out for a drink because the pubs had reopened. We were chatting about things to do, and he said, "Kind of, you know, what tips would you give me?" And I said, "Just, just try a bunch of things and figure out which things you like. Figure out which things make you happy. Which things put a smile on your face." Try as many different things as you can early in your career, because you know what? You're going to be working till you're 70 or later. And you've got lots of different things that you can do in that career. So test some things out. He's managed to get a job at the uh, the big um, slingshot or no catapult, catapult lab up in Aldley Edge near Manchester University working on coronavirus. So he's going to do that for a year after having finished his degree, and then he's going to figure out what it did he like that? Did he enjoy it or not? So work life balance is about understanding what you're looking for, understanding what makes you happy, understanding what your goals are and trying to balance those things on the mental health thing. Um, I, that just that just grew out of one of my side things. I really like water. I really like being outside. Uh, I, I've done a lot of scuba diving in the past and as a side hustle, I'm a scuba diving instructor. So we would do a lot of um, first aid training for people. So um, primary care, secondary care, oxygen provision, those kind of things So training people to use that equipment. Um, and then recently there's been also uh, a mental health first aid element to that. So looking after people from a physical and mental perspective coming together in, in, in one group. So that's where my interest sprang from. It was doing that scuba diving instruction and teaching kind of medical things on the side. I love that idea, the sense of uh, trying out lots of things uh, and be, always being curious, I think. Um, have you had a mentor or coach or role model uh, in your career? I 
think honestly the answer is no, I haven't. Um, I know we teach people that you should have a mentor, a role, or a coach. What the the mentors th that I've had are have been very diverse and wide ranging, and I tend to kind of move through them. So I have like people I go and like have coffee with and chat with. I don't think I've had just one mentor that's kind of taken me all the way through my career. So it's been multiple people. So, you know, some people have like a single mentor that kind of keeps them going forever. I've not had that. I've had multiple people. Um, I would go more for the inspiration side, kind of like I, I'm an avid reader and av avid audiobook person. So I think if I was going to say who my marketing mentor was or is, it would be Seth Godin, I think. So Seth Godin, I find particularly inspiring um, and actually listening to his audio books, um, you know, reading, reading the books and his regular online posts. And also he runs a range of really, really interesting courses online um, under, under the name Akimbo, A-K-I-M-B-O. So they're really, really interesting in terms of prompting you to reflect and work with others and get feedback from others around particular disciplines. So there's an alternative MBA that they do, which I did. Um, and then there's one called the Marketing Seminar, which is also great. And it's more about like taking individual kind of study topics and self-leading yourself through those topics and that material and writing about it very quickly and then getting feedback from others. And it's a really interesting kind of online forum for it. So I'm going to say Seth Godin, I think. It would either be Seth Godin, Godin or Simon Sinek, but I think Seth Godin probably tops it for me. Thank you. Um, looking at other questions, uh, do you have any advice on when the best time to make a career change could be? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I've just changed roles and companies during the height of a pandemic. and Everyone I've spoken to have said, are you mad? Why would you do it then? The really interesting thing is there are, you know, many roles out there that people are hiring for and a lot of candidates are not moving. The really good candidates are not moving. So you can almost say that actually now is a pretty good time to be out there looking and to, and to maybe think about your tolerance of risk in terms of doing, of, of making those moves. Um, one thing I would say, one thing that I, I found in interviewing with a whole bunch of different companies and looking at different opportunities, you have to find a way, if you can, to meet people in person in a socially distanced, safe way. So what I ended up doing was I would go to Hyde Park in central London um, or I'd go to Battersea Park and I'd cycle down there and I'd arrange a set of meetings through the day and some of the cafes were open so you could get a coffee or a sandwich. And I'd arrange to meet people on particular benches in particular places and we'd have a socially distanced chat or we'd walk around with me pushing my bike. And you could actually get that kind of magic of interacting with a person. And I think the whole. Oh, get the lights back on. Um, that whole thing of. Zoom and Teams and Hangouts work really, really well for kind of screening, but there's a certain personal chemistry that you need to build up to make something happen. So now is a good time to be looking and to talk to people when they're looking for roles, uh, when when they're looking for candidates for 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 jobs. Um, but you'll still you're still going to need to kind of figure out a way of. Talking to them in person in a safe way. Um, the one other kind of interesting tip is there's an app called What Three Words. I don't know if you come across it, but What Three Words allows you to define any five meter square piece of, of the planet using three words. So we were doing meetings with different people for, for interviews using What Three Words. So it would be, you know, you'd actually map out a particular bench near the Serpentine. And then, in, you know, you can't really map that well using Google Maps. But what three words allowed you, allowed you to say precisely which bench it was you're going to meet the person on? So um, there's lots of great tech out there to help you. You've done lots of creative management uh, techniques, I think, David. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a question that was up, but it seems I think I managed to get get rid of it for some reason. Um, so it was around how do you get leadership experience if you're not in a leadership position at the moment? So everybody is in a leadership position and I think there's um, maybe a confusion here between 
leadership and management. So often when people ask that question, really what they're saying is, how do I get management experience to manage a team? And management and leadership are two very, very different things. And it's really, really important to internalize that concept. So to me, everybody in the teams that we have, every single team member is a leader. And it comes back to this thing about how do you get a job at Google? Everybody is a, a leader. So everybody is leading in their area. Everyone's owning things. You're not just implementing things that a micromanager is telling you to do. If you're working for a micromanager who's just telling you to do things and giving you no freedom, and you're essentially a robot, a robot, really go look for another job. Go find someone somewhere else who's gonna give you kind of a little bit more free reign and say, this is the outcome we need to achieve. Can you go figure out how to do it? So what are you leading? You're leading your projects. Be very, very thoughtful around like what are the outcomes you're trying to deliver rather than what are the what are the detailed steps? You know, you can get coaching and support on those steps, but you need to own them. And then the other person that you're leading all the time is yourself. You are a leader of yourself. That's your team. Okay, That's the start point for your team. So like, how are you leading yourself? Are you a great leader when it comes to yourself in terms of your direction? And the whole concept of kind of managing people and managing the, you know, pay and rations and kind of how the team works together and how you build culture and stuff, that will come over time. If you can manage a virtual team around a project, if you can lead a virtual team around an outcome for a project, that's the stepping stone to managing physical teams, if that's what you're looking for. Um, I think the one caution that I'd throw in there is figure out what you really love doing. A lot of people who love doing something like a particular task find that they get end up getting given a team of people to manage and then they can't do the thing that they really love anymore. So think carefully about what you want to do with your life. You know, life is short and I think this pandemic has brought that home to a lot of people. Are you doing things that you love? Do you really enjoy what you do? Do you have a smile on your face each day? And if you don't, maybe try and think about the things that you do want to do that would give you a smile and that would allow you to kind of move move your experience and your life forward and you know what take some risks kind of move move to some different roles try some new things it's not the end of the world if something doesn't work out thank you david and um i see we've got a question from a recent grad here so i'm going to ask this um what tips would you give to a recent grad who's struggling to break into their field of study engineering thanks mm. So I assume the question is they're struggling to find a role out there, an engineering role out there. Yeah, that's and, how I understand it. Yeah. Um, I hope I hope we're doing, that's how he, he or I she think, it. So what I'd say is, I'm assuming you've got a LinkedIn profile. Have a think about what makes you different. Does your LinkedIn profile look exactly like everybody else's? What experience do you have and how can you build on it? Who do you know that you can get a conversation with? You know, if your field of study is engineering, for example, you've probably got some people that you could say, hey, I'm looking for some coaching around kind of how, you know, how I'm going to find find the role and identify the role that I'm looking for. Um, would you have a coffee with me? So some of those soft things are a lot better than saying, do you have any jobs? So getting together with somebody, people will generally kind of give you half an hour of their time. You know, you've got a connection with them and they're, they're a nice person. They'll give you they'll give you some coaching. They'll give you some support. You know, they'll, they'll help you on that. So find the people who will talk to you, get a coffee with them, network. You know, you can join online events or when physical events come back, go and network at those things, talk to people. Try and take some of the soft approaches to it but also recognize, and it kind of comes back to that thing about how do you get a job at Google? You know, role-related knowledge is one. So maybe you've got good, good strong role-related knowledge. You, you need to figure out like, how can you connect there? And then how can you differentiate yourself? So on the leadership side, do you do anything outside of your chosen career that shows you can be a leader? Is there anything, if you've got no experience, do voluntary work. Find something where you can give back. If you're an engineer, start a, start a project that actually helps someone in the community that demonstrates what you're doing. 
find something that gives you sparkle, that gives you magic. Show that you can solve difficult problems. You know, write your blog of, of the problems that you're solving in these this volunteer work that you're doing and show how creative you are. So it's about going the extra mile. It's about figuring out how you get into that. It's about not watching Netflix all day, but getting out there and doing stuff. Um, and it's very easy, you know, if you come back to this mental health idea and kind of being the best version of you that you can, then it's very easy just to sit there all day and kind of think, OK, there's nothing out there to to engage in and do. Turn the TV off, turn your computer off, go and or turn it off kind of video channels, go and find things you can get engaged and involved in. See if you can volunteer, see if you can do stuff. Who can you connect with? Who can you go and have a cup of, cup of coffee with? You know, who's out there that could help you? Or if during these difficult times now, maybe someone will give you kind of 20 minutes on, you know, just like a, a virtual, we call them donuts. I don't know if you've got that concept. So a donut is when you have a meeting with somebody who you don't normally work with or hang out with. Um, and you just kind of say, hey, how are you doing? Um, it's like a virtual kind of cup of coffee with somebody. Um, so just just find ways to break and then look for opportunities that will allow you to pivot into potentially new areas. Um, so a really inspiring person who who used to work on a team of mine, interestingly, went off to start his own business just before the pandemic um, and then found that it wasn't working. And then the pandemic hit and they were really, really stuck. But what they did was they figured out there was some specialist food delivery stuff that they could do around London and they had access to some resources and they knew somebody in a particular business and they pulled some strings and they they found a way of getting a van and then they went out and started delivering food to people who were finding it difficult to get out and who in that early stage couldn't get food delivered because the systems weren't in place. And they set up this whole project and spun it up from the ground up. They didn't make much in the way of money from it. They just kind of kept things going and moving along. But they got an amazing experience and they got an amazing story to tell. So if you've got great experiences and great stories to tell, you will get the role you're looking for. Oh, thank you. And I, I would encourage anybody who's a recent grad to really reach out, as Dave was saying, either on LinkedIn or Imperial Plexus. Um, yeah. Never known anybody. Sometimes people aren't responsive uh, just because they don't see the, the the message. But just generally speaking, people are very open to sharing their experience. Um, and that interesting one here. We haven't got too much long to go, but um, is it normal to not really know what we want in life? Where do you find your passion? Do you always know what you want? Um, yeah. I like that. <laughs> I, I, I love that because I I've been exactly like that. So when I was at school, I was kind of science and arts kind of did both um, and very early on did a lot of electronics and radio and that kind of stuff and then discovered computers and started programming and I worked worked part time for a games company just kind of for free kind of because I loved coding just kind of writing pieces of computer games this is for the ZX Spectrum so that really dates me um, and did all of that work and then actually the interesting thing is kind of I I finished my A-levels and I applied for electronic engineering at Imperial. And I also, you know, in the back of my mind, I'm like, I think computing is actually really the thing that I, I want to do, but I'm, I'm not sure, like electronic engineering at the time was more the thing to do. And then I got this apprenticeship programmer role and I thought, I know, I'll go do that because I love programming. I'll do it for a year or two, make some money, come back and do this degree. And then of course I never did the degree and I went full time into it. So one way maybe to think about this is the lily pad idea, which I'm sure you've all heard before. But, you know, if you think about getting from like A to B across a pond that's covered in lily pads, you move from one lily pad to the next to the next. But actually, you might take a bit of a weird route through that. And if you think about the opportunities that present themselves to you, you don't have to necessarily think about this is it. I'm going to be pre president of the United States. It's more a case of like, OK, I know the direction I want to go and the objective that I've set myself. And actually, what are the opportunities that present and which doors open right now? You know, and if the door won't open, try one of the other doors that are in front of you that you all have plenty of doors that are there for you to that you can go and do things. Some will be kind of more financially rewarding than others. Some will be more experientially rewarding than others. 
some will take you to places you've not been before and as you learn you will change as a person and become a different person and maybe take a different direction as well so yeah it's completely normal most people are like that some very privileged people know exactly what they want to do from day one and they do it most people don't and they kind of go through life going it's the direction i'm taking yeah let's see what opportunities present themselves and maybe coming back to my son here you know he finished his biomed degree didn't really know what to do was thinking about going and doing a master's coronavirus came along the big lab opened in manchester he's like oh i'm just going to do that for a year because that sounds really interesting and i'll get some real world experience for it and then let's see what i've become as a person by the end of that year and make a decision at that point I'm hearing things like being curious, being brave, yeah. having a general sense of direction, thinking about your values um, quite deeply, um, but also about learning. So I'm going to, uh, we've got a few minutes left. So very, very MBA question this. How did your MBA program at Imperial help shape your career pro progression? And what were the key takeaways from MP the MBA, which were the enablers? So the first thing was, was like an MBA question. <laughs> exactly. I think the first thing was the network that you go away with, the people. Um, so the broader imperial network and then the cohort network itself as well, which I still meet up with people from the from the cohort fairly regularly. You know, they, they've kind of become life friends and they're really diverse as well. It's a very different group of people. So the cohort that you're engaged with is really important the organization is important kind of having almost that base that you can go back to that you can network with you know if you ping someone on on who's also an imperial alumni on linkedin and just say hey i'm an imperial alumni i'm looking just for a bit of help would you mind if i pick your brains a bit you know you've got more chance than if you're just like a random person you've got a connection with them you've got some some mechanism there for connecting um Sorry, Nicola, I just completely forgot the question. So what you got out of your MBA Sorry. and how it's uh, uh, actually... I, went, I forgot the question. Um, so the network, yeah. And then the other thing is the ability to go into any topic and solve any problem. So what an MBA teaches you, and the reason that I would recommend doing an MBA absolutely to anybody, particularly if you want to be in kind of like a management function or like a cross-functional role, is it allows you to think in a diverse way across different things. So you can think about product development and product design and service design and finance and accounting and marketing and sales and organizational behavior and economics. And, you know, there's a million different things there. So what you can do is you can leverage like, you know, you've got just enough knowledge to be really, really dangerous across all those topics. So what you can do is you can pull things together and you can see things that other people don't see. So the reason MBAs generally are able to navigate in a different way is that they have multi they have multiple skills. It's a little bit like somebody who can play every instrument in the orchestra, but they're never going to be kind of a maestro at, at the violin, but they can just about get away with it and therefore they can coordinate things. It's a bad analogy, but you've got those broad set of skills and you can go sufficiently deep. And also, I think the other thing is it changes the way that you think a little bit as well. You, you think in a different way. You understand the opportunity to kind of make a difference and you know to found a business or lead a business or any of those kind of things. So I would really encourage anyone to if you're thinking about it, particularly during a rough time like this, go do an MBA. Hey, great use of your time. You know, if you're finding it tough to get a good role, go do an MBA, build a network, get some great new capabilities and skills and meet some interesting people. Thank you. We didn't prime you to say that, David. <laughs> well, I, get, um, I get a good mark for that. David. Yes, you definitely <laughs> do. You have lots of good marks. So um, we're at 13.29, so I'm, uh, I think that will be the last question. Um, we'll have another alumni in the Spotlight event on the 28th of July. Uh, look out for it in your e-newsletters. I encourage you to join uh, Imperial Plexus, our online community platform, um, the uh, LinkedIn group so that you can make connections such as Dave has been talking about. And um, also, if there's anybody you would like to see in the spotlight or you might want to think about being in the spotlight, please, um, please also just send us your uh, ideas. 
And I really just want to say an incredibly heartfelt thank you to David because that was so interesting, so enjoyed doing it. We got on just in time. Teams wasn't uh, the easiest thing to get on for, but um, but it's it's just been really enjoyable working with you once again. And uh, so interesting to hear about your thoughts on self leadership and having uh, developing your career and and everything else so a big thank you david very very appreciate well, thank you to everyone who tuned in um you know if there's anything i can do to help any of you just drop me a message on linkedin don't try and sell me something um but if you do drop a message and say hey i was on the imperial alumni thing i've got a question then i'll respond back to you um i may not be able to give you all kind of like you know a coffee chat um, I'd say go to your own networks first rather than all hitting me for a cup of coffee. That's going to take days of my time. Um, but like go to your network. But if you've got a question you've got, just ping it to me on, on LinkedIn. I'd be happy to connect and happy to happy to do what I can to maybe give you any insight I may have. Thank you very much, David, and, and uh, very best of luck in your new job. Thank you. And um, we'll be sharing a survey, I believe, in uh, the Q&A. If you can respond to that, everybody who's participated. And um, thank you. And this is the end of our, our session. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.